Hi, I'm Barney Schwenke, the pastor here of Faithway Baptist Church in Leesburg. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to watch this sermon video we're about to show you. My prayer is that God will use this message, along with you being part of a local Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church, to help you grow in your walk with the Lord. Trust that the following message will be a blessing to your heart. First Thessalonians chapter 4, our text up there on the screen. And then if you want to keep your finger there, we're also going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 a little bit as well tonight. And so if you don't mind swapping back and forth, we're mostly going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, but a sister passage to that is 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. Um, the book of Micah, there's several places that go along with it, but we're going to be primarily in 1 Corinthians and 1 Thessalonians tonight. And I say that because on Sunday mornings here at Faithway, we're going through the book of Daniel for our growth group hour. And if you want to know more about end times theology and uh, what the book of Daniel prophesies about the end times, we're going to be going through that on Sunday mornings uh, in the month of June, and uh, we'll be ending sometime in early July when we go through that. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, a couple pages back to the left, will be 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and uh, that's going to be our text here together tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, let's read verses 13 through 18 together. I'll read, and you can follow along there in your Bible. Paul said, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. By the way, there is a comma there, ignorant, comma, brethren. He doesn't, not ignorant brethren, right? Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, question, do we believe that Jesus died and rose again, yes or no? Yes, all right, so we do. Even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain... Unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them, or that word there in the Greek we'll talk about in a moment, that means precede. So if you want to underline that, highlight that, precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, to be honest with you, I could quote these six verses, seven verses, six verses uh, verbatim, because almost every single funeral that I do for a Christian, I will open the First Thessalonians chapter 4, and I will read this passage of Scripture. It means a whole lot to someone who has recently lost a loved one. Whenever I stand in a cemetery and I see the scar in the earth, and you look down that hole, five, five, six feet under, right, whatever that hole, however deep it might be, and I see the freshly dug dirt, I can't help but think to myself, one day they're going to dig a hole for me. And one day they're going to put me in a box. And one day I'm going to be asleep, as Paul puts it here in this text. And to make my life count, I guess that's something that always hits me every time I do a funeral and have that opportunity to do so. But here in our text, Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica. Now, I've got to remind you, if you're here with us tonight, it's the first time in a long time, the church at Thessalonica was a church that was an infant, a baby church. They didn't have the privilege of a pastor that went to seminary and had experience. No, they got saved, and Paul started the church with Timotheus and Silas, and then just a few weeks, I think three months after the church got started, they got run out of town. Paul and his followers did. And so the church is left behind at Thessalonica. What do we do? They only had just three months of training under the apostle Paul, and so like any pastor, would be very concerned about what is going on. Paul was wondering, how is the church doing? So he sends a messenger back, Timotheus. And he says, Timothy, go out, go back to Thessalonica, infiltrate the church, find out what's going on. He writes a solid letter back to Paul. This is what's taking place. And then in response to Timothy's report, Paul is now writing the letter of 1 Thessalonians. And there's three major areas that Paul challenges this church in. The first area that he challenged them to grow in was their area of holiness. By the way, we talked about that last week. Uh, the sermon is up on our website if you want to go and listen to that again if you weren't here. God wants a pure church. He doesn't want a church that is dabbling in immorality and fornication. He said, flee those things. Run from that. It has no place in the life of a believer. So he challenged the church to holiness. 
He also challenged them to grow in their love one to another. We understand, you know, from an intellectual standpoint, that we are not islands unto ourselves when we come through these church doors. We are to love one another. But it's very hard to love some people, isn't it? Right? We talked about that. And Paul challenges them in chapter number 2 to let their love shine forth. And the third area that Paul is now going to address in the latter part of chapter number 4 is their hope of the return of Jesus Christ. Now, I haven't been able to verify this from the Bible, but what I read in one of my commentators is this. And take it with a grain of salt because it's not God's word. But what one of the commentators that I read wrote about that church at Thessalonica was that there was a, a movement or there was a rumor that was spreading that Jesus was coming again. Now, is that a rumor? No, Jesus said, I will come again, right? And so the church, believing this rumor, believing this teaching that Jesus was going to come again, they sold everything that they had, they quit their jobs, and they were just simply sitting around and waiting for Jesus to come back. Now, I say that because there's no biblical pre or pre pre uh, precedent for it, but early commentators have mentioned that going back to the 3rd century. So it possibly could be true, but we saw last week that Paul said in verse number 12 that they are to walk honestly towards them that are without, that ye may have lack of nothing. In other words, you got to have a job, right? you got to have something to provide for yourself. So church, work. Don't quit your jobs and sit around waiting for Jesus to return. Yes, he will return, but in the meantime... You're supposed to work diligently and work hard as unto the Lord and not unto men. And we get to this passage of scripture in verse number 13. And Paul says, yes, you're supposed to have a job and you're supposed to work hard. But at the same time, your belief that Jesus is going to return is not wrong. In fact, I would like to give you some further clarification, Paul says, from the Lord himself. We'll see that here in a moment. That Jesus will return and God told me a little bit more about what that return is. Is going to look like so look at verse number 13 in your text it says this but I would not have you to be ignorant brethren so for the same reason we send our children to school right we don't want ignorant children Paul says I don't want you to be ignorant Christians I I'm gonna tell you something regarding those people who are asleep that you sorrow not even as those which have no hope now the church was very concerned about the folks who had become believers, but that, but that had died. Now, the people that had died in the Thessalonican church, they could have died from natural causes, right, heart attacks, cancer, or they could have died from persecution that had come on the church. We don't know. But the church was concerned, if you die, where are you going to be? Because it says, concerning them which are asleep. So apparently, the church had questions for the Apostle Paul regarding the loved ones that were now dead. In the New Testament, maybe you knew this, maybe you didn't, but the death of a Christian is compared to sleep. What happens at death? Well, there, there's the Jehovah's Witness teaching and some other false religions out there that teach that when you die, there's this doctrine that's called soul sleep. Anyone ever heard of that before? The Jehovah's Witnesses will propagate that. And they also they say what happens is, when a person dies, their soul goes to sleep in their body, and their soul and their body stay in the grave until the resurrection. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible doesn't teach that. It's not the soul that sleeps, it's the body that looks like it's asleep. The Bible teaches that when we die as believers, your soul, whether you're a believer or not, your soul is separated from your body. The unbeliever's soul immediately goes to hell, and the believer's soul immediately goes to heaven. You say, can you show me this from the word of God? Yes, I can. All right, Philippians chapter 1, verse number 23. The apostle Paul writing to the church. Remember, he was in a straight betwixt two. He was in a conflict. Having a desire to depart and to be with the Lord. So when Paul said, look, if I stay behind, it's good for the church. But if I depart, where'd Paul say he's going to go? I'm going to go be with the Lord. So Paul was convinced in his mind that the moment he died, he was going to be with the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 8. We quoted this a couple of weeks ago, but to be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. And so until the day of the, of the gathering up, of the taking away, and we're going to talk about that here in a moment, those that have already died, this is what you need to understand, 
If you die before the gathering, before Christ comes back and gathers his church, you will go to a place that we refer to, theologians will refer to as the intermediate state, where the soul is alive but without your body. Your body is in the grave, but your soul is with the Lord. So, verse 13 then, why would Paul describe death as sleep? Well, a couple of reasons came to my mind. First of all, I've done my fair share of funerals, and I've seen open caskets before. And you see someone that is there in the casket, what does it look like? It, it, it looks like they're asleep, right? And they, the morticians do a really good job of making them look, look peaceful. And, and, and then the truth of the matter is, death in and of itself is not harmful for a believer. Because Jesus says that as believers, we will not face the eternal death of hell because of him. John, uh, John 11, 25. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I love this. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. You may think you're dead, but you're, you're going to die, but you're not, right? The moment you take your last breath, when your heart beats its last and final beat, you're going to begin eternal living with God. You're asleep, your body is asleep, but you're alive with God. I think the best way to, well, there's probably a different, better way to illustrate this, but one way I can illustrate it to you today is naps. How many of you love naps? My kids are raising their hands. Amen, right? No, children, I'm not speaking for my kids, but children in general detest naps. Why? Because they would rather be running around wildly, right? Wouldn't they? I mean, most, that's what I was as a kid. But, but when you become a mature adult, you begin to love naps naps right and you begin to crave phil took a nap this afternoon in fact he said if i'm not at church call me <laughs> right because he was taking a nap and, and so so kids listen up right you can talk you can tell a lot about the maturity of a person based upon their love or their lack thereof of naps so anyways uh, someone says go take a nap i say amen i can't wait right but th anyways you grow up you like naps but death for a mature christian in a sense is something, now don't get all morbid on me, but death is something that we should look forward to. Because after all, where are we going to go? <laughs> We're going to go to be with Jesus. Now, I don't want everyone to go home and drink the Kool-Aid tonight. Right? That's not what I'm asking you to do. But, but Paul says in verse number 13, I want to tell you something about those people who are asleep. Look at the end of the verse. That ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Our sorrow is different sorrow. When someone dies, we don't grieve the same way that, that unbelievers grieve. In, in my role as a pastor and doing funerals kind of as a community chaplain, I see the distinct difference on how a believer handles death versus an unbeliever. The unbeliever, when someone dies, if they, someone that attends a funeral of an unbeliever, they will get up at the service and they will say something like, they died so young. What a, what a tragic death. Their focus is going to be on making sure that everyone knows the good that that person did. And I have heard this line a thousand times. And that they will live on in our hearts. Maybe you've heard that before at a funeral. But almost every single time, they will live on in, in, our, in our hearts. If you're a Christian, you're not going to live on in our hearts forever. You're going to live on in heaven forever, right? That, that's the blessing that we have. The believer recognizes that it ain't over yet. Physical death isn't the end. It's just a doorway that a believer must pass through to get to eternity. And as believers, we certainly have our share of sorrow at the funeral. But our sorrow is for us, for those that will miss that person. I think I shared this story with you before, but when my grandmother passed away, I've been a Christian for 50 years, an amazing Sunday school teacher, raised four amazing children, grandkids, 30 grandkids, and just a great godly Christian lady that we looked up to and loved. And, and, and we just, her, she exuded the joy of the Lord. I mean, my wife knew my grandmother before she knew me, just because they were in the same area of Connecticut. And, and my grandma's reputation in Connecticut amongst a lot of Baptist churches, everybody knew Lois Schwanke. Just her, 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 her love for children and, and just preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ was amazing. And one of the things that was so funny, at her funeral, and you say, this is funny, at her funeral, um, the cemetery was shaped like a rectangle, and it was probably about a half mile long from the entrance of the cemetery all the way to the back where, her, where the plot was, where my grandfather was buried. And as we're pulling into the entrance of the cemetery, 
the hearse, for whatever reason, just dies. I don't know if it ran out of gas. I don't know if the something just, it just like didn't go any further. And so here we are, the entire funeral procession. There's probably 50 cars and the casket. And we have a long way to go to get there. And so what do we do? Well, the funeral director's like, we really don't have any choice, but we got, we got to get the casket there. So my cousins and I, the pallbearers, we pick up the casket and we walk a half a mile all the way to the back of the cemetery. And as we're walking, we're laughing because this is something that grandma would have loved. And, and, you know, everyone's like, what are you laughing for? Grandma, she just loved Jesus. And even though we're sad that she's not here anymore, she was in a lot of pain, and she was with the Lord now, and she's wrong thing at all. You're, you're celebrating the fact that they are with the Lord. And, and that's exactly what's going on here, Paul's saying in verse number 13. We sorrow, yes, because we're going to miss them, but we know where they're at. And, and the hearse breaking down, somebody that didn't know Christ would probably be suing the funeral company, right? Funeral director, because they did that. How dare you do that to my mother? We're like, this is great. You know, I've never had this happen before. And we had a great time and memories for the rest of our life. Well... I'm assuming the dead believer, you know, the person that we're talking about here is a believer. But if someone is not a Christian, they have every reason to sorrow, don't they? They're not absent from the body and present with the Lord. They're in the lake of fire or hell for all of eternity. A few hours before the great evangelist D.L. Moody, do you know who I'm talking about? It was a great preacher after the Civil War. God used him in the reconstruction of the great Chicago, or Chicago after the Chicago fire. Great revivals during that era of time. And as he was preaching, he, many millions of people trusted Christ as a savior. But in the final hours of his life, D.L. Moody, he caught a glimpse as he's in and out of coma. He caught a glimpse of the glory that was awakening him. And awakening, for, awakening from a comatose sleep, he said, Earth recedes, heaven opens before me. If this is death, it is sweet. There is no valley here. God is calling me and I must go. His son, who was standing by his bedside, said, No, no, Father, you're dreaming. No, said Mr. Moody, I'm not dreaming. I have been within the gates. I have seen the faces of the children. A short time later, he fell asleep, and then he woke up again after what seemed to be the final death struggle, and he spoke one final time, his final words. He said, This is my triumph. This is my coronation day. It is glorious. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what heaven is like, but I know it's going to be glorious. Did D.L. Moody see heaven? I don't know. I think probably, think probably he had a glimpse of it. And that's what we have in store for all of us who know Jesus Christ. Look at verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, hopefully tonight you believe that, even so them also which sleep, right, in Jesus, will God bring with him. Now, notice verse 14, Paul is preaching the gospel. Jesus died and he what? He rose again. Now, there were some cults, even in Paul's day, that taught that there was no physical resurrection. I'm sorry, they taught that Jesus Christ did not have a physical body after his resurrection. And yet, Paul is going to parallel what happened to Jesus with what will happen to our physical bodies. The gospels tell us that Jesus had a real physical body. You remember Thomas? Doubting Thomas? What did Jesus say to Thomas when he doubted whether or not he was an angel or a hallucination or something else? What did Jesus say? Touch me, right? Put your finger into my wound. I am real. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus had a body and he died. And his body came back to life again. And after the resurrection, he had a physical body. And that is why Paul said in verse number four, 14, notice this phrase in your text. It's very key. God will bring with him. See that prepositional, prepositional phrase? With him. What does that mean? After you die, where did Jesus go after he died? He went to be with the Lord. When we die, we will go to be with him. Paul says in verse 15, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. So what Paul's going to say now, okay church, Thessalonica church, what I'm going to share with you next here in this text is not my opinion, it's not my interpretation. Um, when I prepare a message, depending upon um, how 
how long I have to preach, whether it's Sunday morning or Wednesday night. I'll have anywhere between, if it's, you know, single space or double, you know, notes, probably about five to seven pages of notes. And then I blow it up from my iPad to size 20 font so I can see as my eyes are getting more and more dim, you know. And, uh, but, but that's if I, if I were just to write it out, book report, I'll probably have three or 4,000 words is what it is. And a lot of that is my thoughts or the thoughts of commentators or, you know, just as I'm organizing it and trying to bring a cohesive message to you, I, I, I try to write everything out so I don't make mistakes and I know where I'm going in my message. I try to do that every single time I preach God's word to you. That being said, a lot of that is study, and as I study God's word, that's the direction I'd like to go with you. Paul is saying to them in verse number 15, this is not my opinion. This is not my interpretation. This comes directly from the word of the Lord. In other words, God personally gave this message to me. So church, pay attention. What does it say? That we which are alive and remain. On that day, when Jesus returns for his bride, there will be some of us who will not have died. Very clearly, the Bible states that we which are alive and remain, notice, shall not prevent. I told you that word there in the Greek means to precede them which are asleep. We don't use that word now. We prevent cancer or something like that, right? It's a different meaning of that old English word. So Paul is saying there is a resurrection that will take place. And those of us who are alive when this resurrection takes place won't get our bodies before those who have already died before us. We will get our bodies after they do. Now, I'm assuming that Jesus will come back, right? I'm talking about we. I'm assuming that we are the church and, and that others have died. So, verse number 16 tells us about this resurrection of the bodies. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Very clear who's going to be the one that is going to initiate the resurrection. It's the Lord himself, right? The trumpet's going to sound. We know the Bible tells us in, in the Gospels, Jesus said that no man knows the hour, not even the Son, when Jesus is going to return to earth. So the Father is the only one who knows when Jesus is going to return. So evidently, God the Father on his throne is going to say to his Son, okay, Son, time to go get your bride, right? You've been waiting for this marriage to happen for 2,000 plus years, it's time to go get her. And so the trumpet is going to sound, it says right there, the Lord will descend from heaven before we get to the trumpet with the voice of, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. The word shout there means an order, it means a command, it means a cry. It's a word that a, a horseman would use when shouting a command to his horse. It's, a, it's the word that a, a master of a ship would give when he's shouting commands to his rowers. Or, or a general who's giving instructions to his army. That's the word. So God says that Jesus will, the Lord himself, will descend from heaven with a shout. God will give a command, and it says, with the voice of the archangel. An archangel is the chief angel. Now, there may be multiple chief angels. We don't know. But we know one of the names of the archangels is a guy by the name of Michael. Right? A regal name. Michael the archangel. We know that from Jude verse 9, Daniel chapter 12, verse number 1, which, by the way, we're going to get into in a few weeks on Sunday morning. I, I love that passage of Scripture. Daniel the prophet, he mentions the name of Michael, one of Michael's chief responsibilities is protecting the nation of Israel. And so we know that, that Michael is going to be involved in the events of the end of the world. So the trumpet of God will sound. Now some people, I believe, have gotten their eschatology confused. And I say eschatology, that's a really big word. It just simply means the study of the end times. So people, in my opinion, have gotten their, their study of the end times confused by trying to tie this trumpet in with the trumpets of Revelation. Now, when we were looking through the book of Revelation, we saw that there are seven trumpets that are going to sound. But then Paul talks about, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 52, that the rapture, the taking up of the bride of the church, happens at the last trump. Therefore, some people conclude, I believe wrongly, that the rapture happens at the end of the tribulation, at the last trumpet, when the last trumpet sounds. Now, 
the reason I say I think that's a faulty view, and there are people who would disagree with me, maybe even someone here tonight, that's fine. We're not going to go start another church over it, right? It's not, it's not one of those hills to die on. But one of the reasons why I think that they are misguided is because Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians, and he wrote the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, some 40 years before the book of Revelation was written. And, and I'm not sure that Paul had the seven trumpets that the, the apostle John had in mind. Trumpets in the Bible are used for several things. Quite often they were used in the Bible days, in Jesus, I'm sorry, in the Old Testament days, to gather people together or to gather an army. Um, for example, in Judges chapter 6, verse number 34, Gideon blew a trumpet, the Bible tells us. And he blew the trumpet and he gathered the people together to fight the Midianites. And I think in verse number 16, as I interpret the Bible kind of, making my best, I guess, comparing scripture with scripture, what I believe the Bible is teaching here is the blowing of the trumpet has the idea of the gathering. That's the focus of the trumpet. The dead in Christ, he's going to rise, they're going to rise first. They're going to gather together. So those believers who have already died and whose spirits are currently in heaven with Jesus will be the first ones to receive their new resurrected bodies. By the way, can I just teach you a little bit here tonight what the Bible says about our new resurrected bodies? I already told you that Jesus had a physical resurrected body. But just as a person could not survive in outer space without a spacesuit, right? Uh, Branson, I guess, is racing against Bezos to see who's going to be the first one to get to space in the next few weeks here. In order to go to space, you got to have a spacesuit. Just like you need a spacesuit to go to outer space, your body would not survive in heaven. So how do you know that? Well, look at 1 Corinthians there, uh, a couple of pages back to your left. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and um, verse number 50. 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Paul says, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, that's, that's you and me, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit corruption. All right, so Paul is saying there that our new bodies will be, they, they, they have to be perfectly designed in order to enjoy heaven forever. That's what Paul talks about First Thessalonians chapter 4. Look at verse number 39 of chapter 15 as well. So back up a couple of verses there. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of man, another flesh of beast, another, another fishes, and another of birds. Are all, there are also celestial bodies and bodies celestial. Now, I know the Mormons like to take that passage of scripture and twist it. But what Paul is essentially saying there, I believe, is that there are eternal bodies. There's a difference between the body we have here on this earth and the body we're going to have in heaven one day. The body that I have right now is falling apart. And I know some of you that are older than me, you're saying, you don't know, you don't know the half of it yet, right? You're, but my body is. I get up in the morning and I don't have that same spring in my step I had when I was in my 20s. Everything is starting to hurt a little bit. If I work out the day before, it really hurts when I get up the next morning, right? So we're going to have a new body and I'll probably have a full head of hair again one day in heaven. And, you know, we're going to be perfect like God because Jesus Christ, when he was here on this earth, he was able to go through walls. Uh, could he fly like a bird? I don't know. But he was walking down the Emmaus Road and he just, poof, he appears and then poof, he disappears. So we're going to be able to fly, whatever that means. Right? I believe we're going to be able to go to and fro. And we'll be able to enjoy all that God has created in heaven, similar abilities to what Jesus had because of our new bodies. Heaven is not only an amazing place, but we'll be able to enjoy it completely because we don't have the pains of this earth. How many of you struggle maybe to lose weight or you struggle with just the, you know, the diets the doctor puts you on or the medicines that you have to take? Kurt, you're going to like this one. All right, here we go. I know I'm not supposed to tell jokes in church, but this is a good one. An 85-year-old couple had been married for almost 60 years. They died in a car crash. They had been in good health for the last 10 years, mainly due to her interest her interest in health, food, and exercise. When they got to heaven, those pearly gates, St. Peter took them, by the way, we talked about that before, there is no St. Peter at the pearly gates, but anyways, St. Peter took them to their mansion, which was decked out with a beautiful kitchen and a master bath and jacuzzi. They oohed and awed, and the old man asked Peter how much it was going to cost them. It's free, Peter said, this is heaven. Next, they went out to their back porch, and they surveyed the championship golf course that their house backed up to. 
They'd have golfing privileges, Peter explained, every day. And each week the course changed to a new one, representing the great courses on earth. The man asked, how much are the green fees? Peter replied, this is heaven, you get to play for free. Next they went to the clubhouse and they saw the lavish lunch buffet and all the cuisines of the, of the world that are laid out there. How much is this going to cost? It's heaven, Peter said. It's free. A little exasperated this time. And, and then the wife said, well, well, where's the low fat and low cholesterol tables? Peter said, well, this is the best part about heaven. You can eat as much as you want and whatever you want and you'll never get fat and you'll never get sick. This is heaven. With that, the old man just threw his hands up in anger and started threw his hat down on the ground. And, and Peter and his wife tried to calm him down, asking him what was wrong. The old man looked at his wife and said, this is all your fault. If it wasn't for your horrible bran muffins, I would have been here 10 years ago. <laughs> all right, no more jokes, I promise, Kurt, okay. Verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So evidently, verse number 17, there will be those who are alive and remain. It says, they will be caught up together. We, our, our church believes, and I do as well, that there will be a rapture of the church. Someone says, well, there is no rapture that is mentioned in the Bible. That word there, um, to be caught up together with them in the clouds, caught up comes from the Greek word, which means to seize, to carry off by force. Kind of the same idea that Elijah, you know, when he, we're going to see this Sunday morning, he was caught up in a fiery chariot. There's nothing earthly that could have stopped Elijah from going up to heaven. God says it's time. And so it means to claim for oneself, to snatch away. And some people say, well, the word rapture is not found mentioned in the Bible. Well, if you read a Jerome's Latin Vulgate, which has been a little bit corrupted by the Catholic Church, but if you read the Vulgate, that's where the word raptoro comes from. The word rapture comes from. It just simply means to be, to be caught up together, to be caught away. So someone says, is the rapture going to happen? I, I believe that it will. And there are a couple distinctive aspects of this event that we need to notice. First of all, you're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse number 51. Paul, keep your finger 1 Thessalonians because we'll go back there. But Paul says in 50, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Remember the word sleep, right? means to die. But we shall be changed. Notice this, in a moment. The word moment there is where we get our English word atom from. If you know anything about an atom, remember from chemistry, uh, you can't cut it in two, it can't be divided. Or at least when I was in high school, that's the way it was. I don't know if things have changed. But you, you can't divide an atom. The word twinkling there is a rapid movement like a throwing of a spear. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it's a, a, a casting of a glance. Now, now, you and I, we blink our eyes so fast that we don't notice our blinking. Not Now that I told you, you're probably going to start to notice your blinking. But you don't normally notice your blinking. Now, I want you to think of you're sitting in church... And you're looking at me. I know it's a very hard thing to do. But you're sitting in church and you're looking at me, listening to the boring guy up front. Your eyelids get heavy and, and you give yourself a strong blink and you open your eyes. And when you open your eyelids, the person that you see next is not me, but it's Jesus Christ. That, that's the picture here. Okay? It's going to happen so quickly. But I want you to notice, not only does it happen quickly, but the Bible teaches. In fact, Jesus himself taught... It's going to happen unexpectedly. Jesus said that when you see, therefore, the abomination of the desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, that's from the book of Matthew, and I didn't cite exactly what chapter, but I can get that for you later. Roxella, if you ever, uh, never mind, we won't go there. But the abomination of the desolation is a future event that takes place in the middle of the tribulation where the Antichrist will enter into the te temple of Jerusalem and he will sacrifice a pig on the altar of God and he will declare that he is God. Now, this is why I say it happens unexpectedly. Because the prophet Daniel, and we're going to see this in a couple of weeks, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, and Daniel chapter 12, verse number 11, teaches us that there will be 1,290 days from the moment that the Antichrist declares himself to be God until Jesus, 
is now going to come from heaven and he will be the king on earth. So if we have a precise number of days from the abomination of the desolation until Jesus shows up on planet earth, his coming would be predictable. And yet Jesus said in, in, in the book of Matthew that, that nobody knows when Jesus, the day or hour knoweth no man. So if Daniel says it's predictable, but Jesus says no one can know, how can it be predictable and yet unpredictable at the same time? And the answer that, that I believe is that they are two separate events. The rapture of the church, the gathering up of the church, will happen suddenly and unexpectedly before the tribulation occurs. Jesus will snatch away his church. The full return, which will take place at the end of the tribulation, is when Jesus returns in his king, to, to his kingdom to conquer his enemies, and we will reign and rule with him on planet Earth. That return will happen like clockwork, the middle of the tribulation, the, ab ab the abomination of the desolation, and that's why, verse number, if you're back in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, Paul says at the end of that verse number 17, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So I believe that, and you may disagree with me, that's fine, but at the end of the, when the tribulation takes place, that we will be with the Lord during that seven year period. And when, when that is over, we will return with him and we will be with Jesus when he sets up his kingdom on earth. The best part of all of this, that whether it's by death or it's by the rapture, the best part of all of this is that one day we will be with Jesus. The last funeral that I did was for a believer, someone who knew the Lord. I, I, love, I love it when someone, the, I call the widow and she says, let's sing to God be the glory. And let's sing songs like it is well with my soul. I, it just... You know, they know their Bible and they know where their, their loved one is at. And as I was preparing for that funeral, I shared this story. I ran across the story and I asked the lady if I could share this at the funeral and I did. John Blanchard was a, uh, worked, it was in the military and during World War II. He stood up from his bench and he straightened his army uniform and he studied the crowd of people making their way through Grand Central Station. He looked for a girl whose heart he knew but whose face he didn't, the girl with the rose. His interest, had begun or his interest in her had begun 13 months before in a Florida library. John took a book off the shelf and he found himself intrigued, not with the words of the book, but with the, pencil no the notes penciled in the margin. The soft handwriting reflected a thoughtful soul and an insightful mind. And in the front of the book, he discovered the previous owner's names, Miss Hollis May. With time and effort, he located her address. She lived in New York City. He wrote a letter introducing himself and invited her to correspond. The next day, he was shipped overseas for service in World War II. During the next year and a half, the two grew to know each other through mail. Each letter was a seed falling onto a fertile heart. A romance was budding. Blanchard requested a photograph, but she refused. She felt that if he really cared, it wouldn't matter what she looked like. When the day finally came for him to return from Europe, they scheduled their first meeting. 7 p.m. at the Grand Central Station in New York City. You'll recognize me, she wrote, by the red rose that I'll be wearing on my lapel. So at 7 p.m. he was at the station looking for a girl whose heart he loved, but whose face he had never seen. I'll let, you, I'll let Mr. Blanchard tell you what happened next. A, a young woman, he said, was coming towards me, her figure long and slim. Her blonde hair lay back in curls from her delicate ears. Her eyes were as blue as flowers. Her lips and chin had a gentle firmness. Her pale green suit was like a springtime come alive. I started going towards her, entirely forgetting to notice that she was not wearing a rose. As I moved, a small, provocative smile curved her lips. Going my way, sailor, she murmured. Almost uncontrollably, I made one step closer to her. Then I saw Hollis May. She was standing almost directly behind the girl. A woman well past 40, she had graying hair tucked under a worn hat. She was more than plump, her thick ankled feet thrust into low-heeled shoes. The girl in the green suit was walking quickly away. I felt as though I was split in two. So keen was my desire to follow her, and yet so deep was my longing for the woman whose spirit had truly companioned me and upheld my own during the darkest days of the war. And there she stood, her pale face was gentle and sensible. Her gray eyes had a warm and kindly twinkle. 
I did not hesitate. My fingers gripped the small, worn, blue leather copy of the book that was to identify me to her. This was not love, I knew, but it would be something precious, something perhaps better than love, a friendship for me, which I had been and must be grateful. I squared my shoulders and held out the book to the woman, even though while I spoke, I felt choked by bitterness of disappointment. I'm Lieutenant John Blanchard, and you must be Miss May. I'm so glad to meet you. May, may I take you to dinner? The woman's face broadened into a tolerant smile. I don't know what this is about, son, she answered. But the young lady in the green suit who just went by, she begged me to wear this rose on my coat. She said, if I were to ask you out to dinner, then I should tell you, if, if, I were to, if you were to ask me out to dinner, I should, tell, I should go with you. I should go and tell you that she is waiting for you in the big restaurant across the street. She said it was some kind of test. Very interesting. I read that and I thought, as I shared that story at that funeral, I looked at that widow who was sitting there in the front row. And I told her, I said, you know, our relationship with God is a lot like that. We, we've only gotten to know God through his letters to us, right? Has anyone here seen God? If you have, go write a book and make a million dollars. You haven't, right? You have never seen God before. None of us have. And, and the only way we know about God is from what he's revealed about himself in his letters to us. And one day, we will see him face to face. I love Isaiah chapter 25, verse 9. Listen to this verse. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Like a bride waits for her husband on her wedding day. That is what we as a church are to wait for. Longing to see the face of our Savior. That's why if you're back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look at verse number 18. Paul finishes this an incredible chapter about the resurrection of the church. And he says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, I, I've grown, I guess, and evolved in my view on what Paul is meaning by these words over the years. There is a measure of comfort that comes from knowing that at any moment Jesus could rescue us out of this messy world. Yes, there is. But I've come to think that that's not entirely what Paul is talking about there. H have any of you ever lost a loved one who is a believer? Have you? I know I have. I already told you the story of my grandma. Well, my one grandmother's still alive, but both grandfathers, grandma, lots of loved ones, people in this church that I love dearly are with the Lord. Listen, if you've ever lost someone and their body is lying in a grave right now asleep, according to 1 Thessalonians 4.13, they're asleep in Christ. If that is the case, here's your comfort, verse number 18. You will see them again. They are with Jesus right now, and one day... You will be with them as well. That's the comfort of this passage of scripture. So, does the rapture happen? Does it happen pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib? I don't know. I think I know. But, but not, not worth splitting hairs about. The truth of the matter is we will be with Jesus, right? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the most important thing that you and I can ever know in this world. We go through the darkness. Yes, Jesus will come back and rescue us out of this dark world, but we will see loved ones that have gone on to be with him before. And what a day that's going to be. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the promise of the resurrection. Not only will we get new bodies, not only will we be restored and, and renewed with those that have gone on before, but Lord, we will see you face to face. And like the prophet of old said, we will say one day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. And Lord, we see what's going on in the news right now. We see the world, the direction that our country is in. And we are waiting for you. And we say, even so come, Lord Jesus. I mean, if, it were to, if you were to come tonight, that would be so cool. We'd love to wake up tomorrow morning in heaven. But if not, we comfort one another with these words. Jesus will come again. We thank you, Lord, for your promise that you will return. And Lord, in light of that promise, I pray that it would change the way that we live our life tomorrow. To those that are without Christ, may our testimony draw other people to him. 
And to our brothers and sisters in Christ, like Paul told that church at Thessalonica, we are to love one another. Lord, I pray that that would be our testimony, our reputation here at Faithway Baptist Church, that we love each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, Pastor Barney Schwenke here with you again. Thank you so much for watching uh, the video today and taking time out of your schedule to listen to the Word of God being taught. My prayer is that this message will truly help you in your walk with the Lord. I tell our church family all the time, God's will for your life is a daily walk with Him. So if you have a Bible, make sure you read it. If you don't have a Bible, reach out to us here on our website and uh, we will make sure we send one to you. We want to do everything we can to help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. If you found the message today to be a blessing and you have the means financially to be able to help us, we definitely would encourage you to do so. It costs money to be able to produce these videos and to be able to put these out there on the internet for you. You can go to our website, faithwaybaptistchurch.com, and in the upper right-hand corner, you can click the word give. And uh, there you can make a donation to the media ministry of our church if you so choose. But hey, we do this for you. We want to be a blessing. And so thank you again for joining us today. Like we said, if there's any way we could be a help or a blessing to you or your family, the contact information is there on our website. Please let us know. We'd love to be able to help you in your walk with Jesus Christ. Have a great day.